welcome everybody um, to our uh, our conversation today uh, about how to um, move through this uh, and reframe the conversation uh, about um, Australia Day. How might we look at uh, uh, having this conversation and uh, shifting our national narrative uh, through collaborative partnerships? How might we have a conversation about this complex issue and ha have these conversations in a way that help us to move and shift in positive ways? Can I, um, this is our bigger purpose for today. This is what we hope to address. Now, our agenda uh, for this um, uh, conversation is as follows here. We'll do some welcome uh, and introductions and housekeeping. Uh, that's lovely been done by our um, uh, Virginia. We'll be framing our conversation today. We'll be hearing from our panelists uh, with uh, a, a key critical question and there'll be an order, there'll be an opportunity for you to respond uh, to that uh, uh, conversation through the chat process. We'll lead into another uh, conversation and you'll be able uh, to respond there as well. There'll also be a, a, a final um, reflections and an opportunity uh, to check out and explore what next steps might look like. Um, uh, you can also um, see the bio, and I think it might be an idea just to double check if you've got your mic on as well, uh, lest there'll be um, uh, sirens going off or kids and dogs fighting in the background. Um, my kids are at school and there's a dog in the backyard that we've uh, sedated for this conversation. No, we didn't sedate, that's just me being gammon. Uh, so today we want to create an opportunity, a safe space to have uh, deep conversations, a safe space to have a challenging conversation, particularly at a time in, in the world when things get really polarized really quick. And we want to do that particularly around the January 26 model. And, uh, and we're going to hear from speakers who've had to uh, deal with challenging and polarizing conversations and how they've navigated that space to make good change. So in a moment, I, I'm going to introduce you to our speakers and ask where they're from and, uh, and uh, the conversations that they're having. Oh, here we go. And this is our, um, yeah, this is who we are. Our guest speakers are Ruben Berg, uh, a Gurunditchmara man uh, who's a representative from the First Nations Assembly of Victoria. We have uh, Ashley Wan, and she's uh, from uh, a director of policy and impact with Justice Reinvestment. And we also have our, our CEO from Collaboration for Impact, uh, Anna Powell. I'm going to ask you all, beginning with Ruben, if you could tell me a little bit about where you're coming from in this conversation, uh, uh, about, uh, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about the country you're coming from and uh, in this conversation and what they are contributing. And what does reconciliation look, and what does uh, this changing the date stuff mean for you. So if you can talk a little bit about that, um, that would be good. Sure. Love to, Grant. Nyata, nyato kugunidzmara, nyato nyat linyong Rubenberg. Hi, everybody. As we said, my name is Rubenberg. Um, I'm a Gunidzmara man. So my family comes from a little place called Framlingham, which is down near Warrnambool in southwestern Victoria. And here I'm joining today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. So I acknowledge them and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, I've been really fortunate over the last couple of years to be able to be involved with the First People's Assembly of Victoria. So I'm here, um, I've been elected as a Metropolitan Member for that Assembly, working on the treaty process. And as part of that, I've had to, got to do some collaboration uh, with CFI, with Mark. And so that's, that's my kind of connection to these conversations here today. 
And thinking about the 26th of January, um, it's, yeah, it is a strange kind of feeling as an Aboriginal person thinking about it. And one kind of anecdote I recall, I think it might be worth sharing to give my sense of it is uh, I've been, had the good fortune of playing ultimate Frisbee for Australia and coaching Australia in ultimate Frisbee. And so as a result of that, I've got a bunch of Australia shirts from representing Australia in, in sport overseas. So they've got green and gold and the Southern Cross and all that sort of stuff. And um, occasionally I'll wear those shirts just to walk around, you know, celebrate the achievements I've been able to do and celebrate the sport. And I didn't realize it, but one time on the 26th of January, I was going to a friend's barbecue party. They were just having a birthday party. It just happened to be on the 26th of January. And without thinking, I had worn my shirt from my team, my, my Australian shirt from Ultimate Frisbee. And I distinctly remember that after the barbecue, we'd gone to a hotel and I walked into the bathroom and I saw my reflection and I went, oh boy, I've been wearing an Australian shirt and it's the 26th of January. And I didn't even realize, and I like literally straight away took off the shirt and turned it inside out because I do not want to be associated with being a part of that celebration on that day. So I guess that gives you some insight to my kind of perspective on the 26th of January. Thanks, Ruben. Um, yeah, I'd like to see your Frisbee action sometime, brother. Yeah. Ashley, you're joining us from Gadigal country today. Um, what does this uh, January 26th mean to you? Where, where are you, your country, your relationship to collaboration for impact? And what does this January 26th mean for you? Yeah, Makara, everyone. I'm Ashley Wine. I'm the Director of Policy and Impact at Just Reinvest New South Wales. I'm a proud Nyempa, Varadjuri and Nyemba woman. My country is far west New South Wales. I'm here today with, uh, with you all um, on Gadigal Country um, in the iconic Redfern on the block. Um, so, uh, and our office is not far from here. So I was just speaking with Anna earlier how good a quick commute is. Um, so CFI is deeply woven into the work and I guess the um, understanding of how Just Reinvest New South Wales works. Um, I've been in my role for um, the last seven months, but I was also on the executive committee for two years before that. So having an understanding about the impact and influence and relationship that we've had with uh, CFI um, and they've been facilitating a lot of our great work that we've been um, able to deliver with communities and with government and philanthropy. Um, January 26, it's a, it's a funny time of year. Um, you go through a bit of a, uh, I, I actually don't have social media anymore. Um, uh, it's just, I find a space where there's online commentary that can really just uh, have a, have a toll on you, takes a toll. Um, and for me, January 26, I try to remember the survival and strength of my people. I go to Yarbin on January 26, and it's just really uplifting to see, you know, all the young kids, all the Jarjams running around um, and just celebrating, um, you know, their culture and their spirit and, and meeting with family and, and gathering with community. It's really special. Um, but it is a difficult time. Um, kind of reflecting on injustices that still have an impact on First Nations people um, today, which is a lot of the work that we try and advocate for um, at Just Reinvest New South Wales. So I'm glad to be here today with you all. Thanks. Thank you, Ashley. And um, it's, it's good to have you here with us. Anna Powell joins us. Um, Anna's the um, CEO of Collaboration for Impact. Anna, um, we're about do you join us from and what does the January 26 mean for you personally? Yeah, thanks Grant. Um, good to be part of this conversation. I think it's a really, it's become a bit of a ritual, hasn't it, to have these conversations um, with our partners over the last few years. And I feel like it really sets up conversations for us to continue having um, in our field and actually as a country um, for the year to come. So. Um, wonderful to be here today. Um, look, I was born on Bunurong land and I um, am now living on Mirawina land in Lutruta, Tasmania, just south of Hobart for those, those who know Tassie. 
Um, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands and um, past, present and emerging leaders of it too. Um, yeah, so what, what January 26 means, um, I mean, when I think about the people I can even see around the room right now, and I think about Ashley and Rubin, um, you know, we partner with First Nations Peoples Assembly, with Justice Reinvest, Just Reinvest New South Wales, and many others around here, um, to collaborate in ways that transform the systems that we are a part of. So, you know, what this week um, represents is, is all part of that. Um, you know, I was reflecting last night, January 26 hasn't actually always been Australia's national day. It's something that we created. Um, I think that's important to remember again, particularly as we're in a window, a really explicit context where we are having a national dialogue and conversation about the, the country we want to become more of. Um, so to our theme today around changing narratives, I think January 26, it symbolises the story that we are telling ourselves now um, and that dominant story, um, as well as if I took the optimistic side, it, it shows signs of us wanting to tell a different story. Um, and so I think the conversation we're having now is how are we already doing that through the collaborations we're a part of and creating more of. Um, so that's the hopeful part, um, but I also recognise that this is a day um, that symbolises invasion, genocide and, and colonisation and, and the dominant system that's created in Australia, which means that it's not equitable or just for all the people. Um, so overall, I, I look at this as a, particularly this week, an opportunity to really importance of, um, of pausing to reflect on my part in the system, the privilege and power that I have and, and how I do that with my community, the organisation, the collaborations that I'm a part of as well. I take that really seriously um, and reminding myself back to the purpose, you know, um, that it's about creating systemic changes so that we're not having this same conversation in the same way um, in the next generation. Um, so personally, I choose not to take it as a public holiday because for me, the work it needs to continue more so. Um, and it's a commitment that I have, but it's also a day of, um, yeah, being side by side with, um, with allies and collaborators in this. Thank you so much for that, Anna. Um, to the room, I just want to uh, invite you, if you haven't already, you can actually go on to our chat and introduce yourself and uh, the country where you're coming from uh, this morning. Also, on this particular slide, we invite you to annotate uh, on this map where you're joining us from by using, um, using a heart stamp. So you click on the view options part if you, of your mouse on your machine, and I'll do this in real time with you just to show that if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, come up and find where options is. Up the top, view options, click on that. And then you'll come down to annotate. And when you go down to annotate, you click on stamp and choose a heart stamp. And what you do once you've done that is you um, press, or oh, somebody's got into that already. Uh, go and click on the bits of uh, Australia where you come from and uh, let us know where you're coming from. Some of you mightn't be able to do this on a mobile phone, but let us know. Um, uh, in the chat where you're coming from if you can't. Oh, crikey, we've got a lot of mob coming from down in the Victorians and a few in Sydney and Melbourne and and a few in the Noongar country over there in uh, WA. Welcome. Oh, we've got Alice Springs joining us. We've got a um, if you make a mistake, just undo and you can reposition yourself somewhere else.
We've also got a few coming in from oh, Canberra. I've got somebody using a snipping tool to erase. Oh no, that's just a uh, capture where we're all coming from. So we've got a couple of it's me. I'm trying to get the snipping tool off. <laughs> Apologies. No worries, uh, Virginia. We've got some mob up in uh, Cairns as well, eh? In central Queensland. And remote, remote WA, that is amazing. We've got some people uh, uh, coming in from Yagara country. Any mob from coming from overseas? Uh, Joe Riley's in the middle of the ocean there. No, Gammon, can't be. Look, it's lovely to have a visual representation of where people are coming from and to express uh, where you are. And the many language groups, and just to reiterate what was already said before, we want to acknowledge those places where you join this conversation and the country that you're on uh, today and uh, the people groups and the land and sea that they have connection to. So um, yeah, welcome everyone from all of those wonderful places where you're uh, putting your heart stamp this morning, or this afternoon, sorry. Well, it still is morning if you're in Queensland. Folks, um, we wanna to come to the first of our interview uh, questions to our, our, our wonderful panel here. And I, I want to ask Ashley, Ruben, and Anna, uh, and I'll start with Ashley. What, how has collaborations with First Nations stakeholders uh, uh, and with non-Indigenous partners gone for you? In the work that you do, how have you gone working expressly with First Nations and non-Indigenous people and in your context? Um. I think one of the best uh, examples I can share is something that CFI has actually worked on with us as well, um, and that's our recent work with our um, reinvestment forum. We have been working with government and philanthropy um, and also the, the academy um, and looking at how we can elevate communities' voices, leading their solutions um, to design what reinvestment is. Um, when we talk about justice reinvestment, it's not just community-led alternatives to engaging with the criminal justice system. It's also a shift of power and resources from government um, into areas that community is calling for. And that's quite a difficult conversation to have. Um, it's, it's a really um, important relationship to build and a, a space um, to maintain, a, you know, an open mind and collaborative kind of way of working um, because we're trying to, we're aiming for that systemic change. Um, we're really wanting to shift how government is doing things. It's um, important to always have our First Nations stakeholders' voices at the front leading that. Um, and Just Reinvest New South Wales is able to support communities, um, sometimes in translation to government kind of um, terminology or ways of working and vice versa, where kind of that intermediary there in that space. Yeah. Um, you know, for this really long-term generational change that we're looking at, um, instead of kind of investing funds into, you know, more prisons um, in kind of, you know, thinking about ways that we can have that sort of legislative reform, um, really stronger investment in education, housing, reforming bail laws, um, just really looking at different ways, those justice circuit breakers that we need to, um, you know, 
be holding up front um, and government to be you know taking seriously um, and leading that change. Um, yeah, it, it's all about that relationship and trust and understanding. And it's having that common goal that we're trying to reduce the number of First Nations people coming into contact with the criminal justice system. I think there's always going to be those different kinds of views on how to get these things done. Um, and whether sometimes if there's, you know, we're in a space where we do require political will. Um, so it's really just understanding where the different stakeholders, what they're trying to achieve, finding that common ground and um, being able to pull together some goals and outcomes that they can achieve together. Yeah. Nice one. And how's that gone uh, as far as progress with um, your aspirations? It's been quite positive. We've been getting a lot of support from senior government officials in um, state and federal um, governments. So there's been an enormous funding uh, commitment from the Albanese government and also um, as part of the ICE inquiry and the recommendations that came out of that in New South Wales, there's been quite a large commitment to justice reinvestment and supporting more communities to have justice reinvestment in their sites. Yep. Um, at this stage, that is, you know, investment in teams on the ground to support justice reinvestment happening. Um, but the work we're doing in the reinvestment forum is looking at that more it's quite dry. It's that economic mechanism on how dollars in one government kind of um, bucket is, you know, as community is determining which buckets it will be going instead of, you know, having this huge investment in um, you know, punitive measures and measures that harm First Nations people. It's about where can we look at um, you know, different areas of, you know, on that pathway, that trajectory of a person's life. You know, we need to invest in education and housing, employment, health, things like that. So, yeah, it's going good. It's still a um, watch this space. Um, yeah, sure. I think to have another forum this time, uh, sorry, um, before the end of this year to progress that work further. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, um, Ashley. Ruben, this, uh, this challenge is something that you go through with your work as well, collaborating with First Nations stakeholders and non-Indigenous partners. How are you going about it and what's it like for you? Yeah, so I guess not everybody might necessarily be aware of the work that we've been doing as the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. So I guess I can give people a bit of an overview of what that is. And that has involved a lot of collaboration at many different levels. Uh, but the assembly was established back in 2019. The Victorian government here uh, a little while back made a strong commitment that they did want to have treaty conversations, uh, which has been really powerful. And to enable that to happen, they passed a bit of legislation, the Advancing the Treaty Act legislation, and that enabled the creation of the Assembly. And we're an elected group of people from across the state. Uh, we're all traditional owners from Victoria that have been elected by our community. Uh, there's people who are elected from the broader regions, and there's also people elected by their traditional owner group who get seats on the Assembly Chamber. And through that legislation, the Assembly was given three particular tasks to work on. And that was the establishment of a treaty authority, which is basically an umpire to help resolve disputes that might come up while we negotiate treaties. There was also the creation of a self-determination fund is what we're tasked to do. And that's a way of ensuring that community, when they come to the table to try and negotiate treaty, that they have the resources they need, they have the skills and capabilities they need to sit at the table on an equal footing so they can negotiate and get good outcomes for their community. So that's the self-determination fund. And the third thing that we were tasked with was the creation of a treaty negotiation framework. And that's basically kind of a rule book of what the treaty process will look like in Victoria. And, <laughs> and as we know, there hasn't been any treaties in our nation before. And so it's a bit of an unknown. And so we had to try and kind of make up what that process would look like. But through some really significant collaboration, we've been able to achieve all three of those things in our first term wow. as assembly representatives. We had a bit of a tight timeline and that we wanted to try and get all those things done prior to the state election that we just had here in Victoria to make sure we could capitalize on the, the interest that was there from the government. They were re-elected, but we, there was no certainty of that. So we wanted to make sure we got that commitment 
while we could. So that involved huge amounts of collaboration to get that done. Yeah. It involved collaboration amongst us as a chamber. So there are 31 members of us in chamber and we all come from diverse communities, diverse backgrounds and all have different perspectives and different voices. And so trying to get 31 people to come together in a room and agree on something as significant as treaty elements was a challenge and that involved some significant collaboration. We also had then to work with our community to actually bring them on board the journey to make sure we understood what they wanted and how the details of what we were trying to work at could help achieve their interests as well. So collaborating amongst us as assembly, collaborating with our community, but also interestingly enough, the actual process of negotiating these three outcomes was a collaboration with government. Yeah. And I think from the outside, you might think that that sort of negotiation would be kind of a two different parties kind of butting heads. But for most of the work that we did, we did have shared goals. And so it was a collaboration with government. And so one of the biggest challenges was trying to bring together all those bits of collaboration. How do we get the collaboration we've done with community the collaboration of assembly, the collaboration with government to all line up to get the same outcomes. Uh, but we've been able to do that. And I think we've got a really powerful model to now move into the next phase where we can start using the authority, using the fund, using the framework to negotiate treaty outcomes here in Victoria and hopefully lead the way as a model for other states and for the nation. Wow. So not easy, but doable. Absolutely. Wow. Thanks for that, uh, Ruben. Anna. Uh, you're the CEO of an, of an organisation that's supposed to uh, embody this is uh, in terms of tools and processes. Uh, what has, uh, how has collaboration between First Nations and uh, non-Indigenous partners worked for you and the sorts of progress that you've seen come as a result of that collaboration? Mm, nice. Um, yes, so embodiment is something we talk about and try to practice a lot. Um, a little bit more about our role in the system. Um, there's context for it. We're obviously, we're, we're not Indigenous owned. Um, and that's important for us to be mindful about the kind of role and positioning that we have. Um, with that, we also work to start with on ourselves. Um, so how do we embody what we call deep collaboration between um, our First Nations people in the, in the organisation and non-First Nations people and other multicultural Australians um, together? And we see that's really um, the nucleus that then holds and how we, um, informs how we do our work externally. And the external speaks to the internal. It's not one before the other. Um, so that's a little bit about the embodiment, but really a lot of our work comes to how we enable and work with collaborations, particularly in ways that centre communities to lead change. Um, yeah. And obviously, you know, a lot of our roots are in the work that Ashley spoke to in particular, um, early days around Maranooka Burke and the work we did with JR New South Wales there where I think we all learned um, around what it means to be really rewiring a system around a community where communities are authorised and equipped to be making decisions that directly affect them. And in ways that um, don't just shift locally, but also can speak to the wider system that surrounds the community. Um, so a lot of that was our learning collectively around what does it mean to be really doing the gritty work of collaboration yeah. Um, which in part um, is around how we think about power. Um, and that goes to why the embodiment part is so important to us, that we are continually reflecting on what is the, the history that we represent, what's the position that we have in the system now, and that changes in different contexts, and how do we best use and share our power for those shared outcomes. I think Ruben spoke really nicely to the importance of having shared vision and purpose and you know yes it, it can sound surprising that that can happen with government as well and other collaborators but um that is sort of the work of starting with a shared purpose starting with a shared vision and then much of what we do is either supporting other collaborations or be in collaboration ourselves around that gritty work of sharing and renegotiating power toward that shared 
that shared vision and purpose. Um, there's so much more to unpack around that, what actually looks like and means. Um, again, I just want to refer, I'm seeing the faces around this room and I think everyone here has stories about what that looks like. Um, and I think we are starting to see people and as um, different institutions recognising all our parts in that. Um, I see government showing up differently to how we were seeing it a decade ago. You know, government asking questions around how it can be an enabler of community-led decision-making. Um, I see philanthropists asking questions about how they can not just fund into social change um, or ecological change efforts, but how it can be a learning partner in the process as well and rethink its role um, and privilege in having the, the resources it's got in philanthropy. So they're just two of the dominant sort of parts of the sector, the institutions, which I'm, I'm seeing on a daily basis, starting to um, ask different questions about its power. Mm. Thank you, that, that, uh, that's inspiring, um, Anna. I'm going to move to a second round of questions to put to you as a um, as a panel. And it comes back to uh, going into a little bit more detail around that grittiness. Often collaboration means moving beyond um, your safety zone, moving beyond the limitations of your current paradigm of partnership. You might have entered into the process a certain way, thinking well, this is how we imagine or envision partnership to look like. But once you get into the collaboration process, it it moves beyond that. And uh, I was wondering, Ruben, if you could comment on the collaboration amongst the assembly members to acknowledge their differences. Um, mm -hmm. As you were saying that this wasn't just a conversation between black and white Australians, this was First Nations mob sitting down and having yarns about our diversity uh, within the Victorian uh, space. Uh, how did you negotiate um, uh, and collaborate uh, to acknowledge the differences and focus on that higher purpose of treaty? Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, it was, wasn't an easy thing. It was a significant challenge. And like all communities, we have our politics and we have our dynamics of groups aligned with other groups and all those sorts of things. And that all came to bear within our assembly chamber as well in a positive way of trying to all achieve uh, those same really powerful outcomes. And one of the ways I think I found really useful in the work that I was able to do in facilitating some of these conversations and looking at this collaboration was to, at all times, trying to unpack what we were talking about in terms of the interests that we mm. all had. And so that's a really important thing that I try and bring to these conversations is that focus on interests and not just interests at a higher level, which was we want the best outcomes for our community, but unpacking those interests at every single level and trying to really understand the kernel of what it was we're trying to achieve. And the, the great example that's often given when you're talking about interest, especially when you're trying to collaborate or you're trying to negotiate things, is the, the, the classic one about the, the two kids, they're both fighting over an orange, right? They both have an interest in wanting this orange. There's one orange left in the bowl and both kids want an orange. And so they say, I want the orange, no, I want the orange. And they're fighting over that. Their interest is just in the orange. And if you can have a conversation, you can start to unpack that and say, well, actually, you know, child A, what is it that you want the orange for? And they say, I want to make juice, right? I want to drink. I want to make an or orange juice. Okay, that's your interest is in having some juice. And you talk to child B and they say, well, I want to make a, a fruit cake and I want the rind, right? I want to be able to use the orange skin to make, I, I don't like fruit cake and orange and stuff. It's disgusting, but they might want to do that. So they want to just use the rind. And if we can understand the interest, we say, well, actually, you can both get exactly what you want because you don't want an orange. One of you wants the juice. One of you wants the skin. And there's you can both have that. And so to me, that's what it's always about is trying to unpack not just we want an orange, but what is that level of detail? And sometimes those things that you can get both of them. Sometimes there is conflict around that. But sometimes you find when you can unpack some of those interests in collaboration of you know, we'd be talking about a particular thing and one part of the community would say, we want this, and another part would say, we want this, and they seem to be in conflict. But if we can unpack why is it that they want that, what is the underlying issue there, what's the underlying issue for this other tension, we can sometimes see that there's a different option that solves both of those things. Wow. And so to me, that's always the challenge of trying to not just leave things at the surface level, the binary of it's this or that, 
But what's the actual underlying interest that sits within that and how can we find a solution that can meet all those things? And that can be a really challenging thing to do sometimes because we are so focused on just the binary, it's the yes or the no, but how can we unpack that to understand those underlying interests? And that's something that we've had to do a lot of work as an, as, as an assembly chamber. The other part of that, why it's really important is that when we go out to our community to understand what they want, they're not thinking about the details of clause 12 of the framework that we're trying to draft. Like we've got quite complicated technical legal documents that make up what this treaty process is about. And so we, we're not gonna go out to them and say, what do you think clause 4.49 should say? That's, that's, that's not a useful conversation. We need to understand their high level interest. And it's our job to then make sure that clause 4.9a is in line with that interest. So those are some of the things that we've been trying to do to make sure that we shift from that, that paradigm. Uh, the other part of that is when we've been working with government, it's been trying to entirely shift their paradigm about how they think about these things because they have been seeing us often as, as stakeholders, as partners, and we're really trying to shift the narrative that we are rights holders within these conversations and that the way they do business they can't just keep doing it the way they have been and just, just treating us like any other stakeholder. They have to recognise that through the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we as First Nations peoples have very specific rights that need to be respected and upheld. Mm. And that's the lens we're trying to have government see things in, not just, oh, well, if you were a fishery association, this is how we'd treat this collaboration. No, no, we're not like the fisheries association. We're not like the housing association. We're First Nations peoples. We have rights. And, and this is how we need to interact. And it can be a real struggle to have to keep coming back to that. And that's, I think, one of the challenges in this space for us as First Nations people is the amount of times we have to repeat ourselves and have exactly the same conversations again and again. And it feels like you're never getting anywhere. But if you can have that vigilance to just, you know, despite how many times you've had to say it, to say it again, because it can lead to the outcomes we want. So those are some of the ways that we as an assembly and me personally have been able to kind of start shifting that paradigm in the collaboration we've been doing. So I'm picking the orange to see what people actually want. And you can actually, there may be a both end in that. Keeping the big dream alive, particularly for the aunties and uncles on community will say, here's the big dream, make sure 4.9 clause fits that. And then coming back to and reiterating the, the rights-based framework, the, the rules of engagement, I guess, and the, uh, the bigger framework of the, the rights-based agenda from um, uh, uh, from the Declaration of, of the Rights of Indigenous People in that specific sense. So in a broader context, it could mean that we keep reiterating what the purpose and, the, and how, what the rules are uh, and looking for, um, but being curious about the detail just in case somebody wants juice and a rind. Exactly. Brother, thank you so much for that. That was insightful. Um, Anna, uh, does any of that uh, resonate for you in, in the moving beyond limitations of the, you know, people's, you know, traditional understanding and paradigms of partnership? Mm. Yeah, actually, um, I'd love to ask Reuben a question because what really, I was sitting with um, you know, sharing Reuben and thinking, Gosh, the time it really takes to do collaboration well and in ways that stick, you know, that we're wanting to talk about the deep roots of collaboration and systems change, that we want it to last beyond the work we're doing here and now. Um, so I was just, I'm curious, can I throw something back to you, Reuben? Um, yeah, definitely. How, you're, how that's showing up in your work at the moment around balancing both the time it takes to do collaboration, all the fronts you've talked about, all the layers, with also, I imagine there's a sense of urgency of time as well. How, yeah. do you, how do you work with that? It's definitely a really fine balance of making sure we're making progress, but making sure we're bringing everyone along with the journey. And part of the, I guess, the fortune we have as an elected body, as an assembly, is that we have the responsibility for representing the voice of our people in those conversations. So we constantly have a need to go back and check in. It's not at a certain point in time, we're going to go and check in. It's a constant mm -hmm. process of checking in with our community to see that they're comfortable with where we're going and having, having the confidence to be able to say, yes, I believe that we can speak on behalf of our community and say that this is what is desired. And that I think from my 
perspective on what I've seen, that can often be a challenge for us as an Aboriginal community to say that, yes, we're prepared to speak on behalf of that broader group, mm -hmm. uh, but that's something we have to do as elected members, and that's a different mindset for us to have within that. And, yeah, the, the time frames is always challenging. You, the way I look at it is basically in terms of the timing, I want to make sure that everybody's a little bit unhappy that those who want us to go slow are a little bit unhappy that we're going a bit too fast. Those who want us to go really fast are a bit upset that we're not going quite fast enough and find that middle ground where we're moving on, progressing, making sure we bring as many people along with us. But yeah, it is a real challenge to find that balance between those things. Mm. It, um, it resonates in terms of, you know, and patterns we see across um, the other work that we're a part of as well is almost a story we tell ourselves about time and progress. Um, and it's easy to get seduced into that being, you know, there's a project plan or there's a deliverable or there's a workshop for all, a convening we're all working towards. Um, but that too, you spoke about Reuben, you know, that process of checking in is ongoing. The process of collaboration is ongoing. Um, the, the quest, the, the, the need to keep working for equity is ongoing. It's never an end state. Um, so I often think about what are the conditions, like what's the environment, what do we need in place to enable us to, yes, work with the current system and the deliverables and the, you know, getting the early wins, bring people along as well as how do we keep the deepening work of collaboration mm -hmm. and equity through that. Um, that shows up a lot in our community-led place-based change work as well. Um, Grant, I'm thinking about the other question you asked me and, um, there's something also around, I think it goes to the concept of time, about how we here in Australia particularly um, really think about the actions we're doing now in the context of the past and the present that we're working to. And I know that's a particular way of looking at time. Um, but I think when we talk about power, role, privilege, that's something, you know, as CFI, is, you know, I think we're really mindful of in our own practice is what's the context calling for? What do we represent in this context and at this point in time? Um, and the actions we're taking to enable the collaboration need to be really um, aware of what we're representing as individuals, organisations and, and collectives. That's, you know, we talked about the embodiment earlier, Grant. I think that's it's almost an ongoing muscle and um, to keep growing is our own re reflective practice and understanding of but ourselves. And that and shifts. It speaks to what Ruben talked about with constantly checking in. Mm. Are we showing up consistently in a way that matches the time of where the community is at to have the right tools at the right time to take the next steps that matches the moment we're in? Because sometimes mob will be saying, well, we needed that tool 20 years ago when we was trying to do that, and now you're turning up now. And some mob will be saying, ah, too much too soon. We're not ready for that. That's too radical. But collaboration in, there's almost a collaboration of the collaboration in a sense okay. that we constantly have to ask ourselves and check in with each other. Is this still our big purpose we're trying to work through? Is this still what we're trying to achieve? And are we serving that in mm. the right way? Uh, so it's mutually beneficial to you and, and to the dreams we both want to see. Is that, is that a kind of another way to say that or have I misinterpreted? Absolutely, yeah, Grant. And I mean, you know, I've seen this. It shows up in the, again, the gritty, in the day-to-day, -day, doesn't it? Um, yeah. I'm sure Ashley's got stories of this, but, you know, it shows up around funding agreements or it shows up around who's going to sign off on social media posts. You know, it's um, how we are using and sharing power um, and different contexts calling for different ways of, you um, of using that, I think. Um, so we need to be mindful and the biggest story we're writing together, and I think that's um, important, as well as how that's showing up in the day-to-day -day as examples of, I guess, the moments where we can transform those bigger systems is in those day-to-day -day interactions. So, yeah. yeah. Ashley, we don't want to leave you out because we're getting on a roll here. Um, how, has any of these dynamics uh, showed up for you with justice reinvestment in New South Wales? Well, definitely the community pace um, point that you made um, resonates very strong. 
because as fast as we work in a community, it's all determined by our community pace. And when we're thinking about shifting those systems, um, they're big things that don't happen every day. That's things that it's really taking a lot of that, you know, new ground is being broken. So you have to make sure that you're treading carefully, that you do have community, you know, telling you, um, you know, what they're wanting, how they're feeling, what needs to change, what needs to shift. And sometimes that is a gritty part of that collaboration is when we have to relay that to government um, because they can, you know, just want to want to run with it and, and um, work at their pace. But we always need to make sure that we are having community's voice um, heard at the, at the front um always so that can yeah there's a bit of pushback sometimes it can be a bit a bit tricky especially when we're thinking about justice reform um there's still a lot of healing that needs to you know happen along the way a lot of that truth sure. telling that needs to happen especially in in the justice space um you know it's it's not just um, something that you can work towards without having that kind of emotional awareness as well and having that check-in. That's really yeah. important. So um, I think how, you know, paradigms of partnerships has kind of shifted and changed for me, especially in my role and, and my understanding of justice reinvestment with Just Reinvest New South Wales is that there needs to be a lot of flexibility and while we're shifting those systems that government is, you know, authorised to kind of lead, they need to have that buy-in to say, no, we do want to do things differently. We do want to listen to community. Community are the experts. First Nations people are the experts of the solutions, you know, that they want to drive in their community. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, lightly treading kind of, exercise that we have to do it's it's a lot of that kind of government relations and stakeholder relations and you know just kind of um always maintaining that space of um you know shared learning shared practice shared understanding so that you know that it's still going in that general direction you know yeah. Yeah. um but yeah it's definitely being determined by community so um and this may be a question for everybody We've all talked a little bit about pushing the envelope and moving into new paradigms. Has that resulted in a different way of working? Has pushing that, we've all moved and, and we've made, a, is there a new way of working that's emerging in the way that uh, you've collaborated uh, in the past and how uh, pushing beyond the traditional boundaries, has that shaping a new work practice in your organisations? Um, I think if I can answer that one first, um, well, it's definitely shifted the way that we facilitate our gatherings and, and forums. So um, for that reinvestment forum we held last year, we had a community day at the very first, and then we had our yep. government day where community also attended and, you know, um, gave it to the government. So uh, having that first day was so important, uh, having community come together. A lot of the time it's um, communities that hadn't been in the same room was the first time actually that we had our three sites, Burke, Maury and Mount Druitt in the same room together. And it was, um, it was really energizing to hear the conversations, the sharing of, you know, practices that different communities have in, in you know, in their towns, um, what their goals are. And there was a lot of that kind of, um, yeah, they were looking to collaborate. Youth youth workers were wanting to kind of have a have a weekly Zoom or a monthly Zoom to talk about what they do. Um, you know, other project officers wanted to get together so that there was you know that kind of deeper collaboration and a bit of um, I guess consistency across the board as well with what they're trying to achieve because we all have that common you know goal that we're going for. Um, but definitely that's changed the way that we work. And government knew that we had community gathering together first, so they knew as an organisation we were prioritising communities' voices first to feel comfortable to get on board. So that's how it will be business as usual for us now, having a community day first. Mm. Well, that's a great example. I was there for that. That was powerful. You were. 
You sang yeah. a song with your guitar. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No singing today, <laughs> folks. <laughs> next time, next time, yeah. Um, Anna or Ruben, if who has this moving beyond traditional boundaries shaped you? I suppose Ruben, everything's new for the how you guys have for your ways of working every day is uh, uh, breaking new ground. Yeah, so it has. There is a lot of new ground that we're breaking, and by being able to put in place those three elements, the the fund and the framework and the the treaty authority, that has set up new ways of working and moving forward. But I think. The way we've been able to go about it, and to my mind, when I talk about the treaty process, it is a process. It's not a destination. It's an act, it's an ongoing process of of treaty making and and partnerships and collaboration and new new relationships. But some of the things that we're hopefully moving, particularly from a collaboration standpoint with government, is a new understanding around um, the the fact that. We should only be making decisions at certain points of time that need to be made at that point in time. Yeah. And I think there can be a tendency when you're trying to change stuff and shift new things that you have to understand every single part of it before you make the shift. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to move to a different sense where let's let's agree on this principle of how we're going to change things and let's trust in the process that once we've made that, we can continue to work through and find out what the details are around that next aspect. And I guess you can draw all sorts of parallels between this conversation and Australia Day and voice and all sorts of things, but you need to have that trust that let's only have to worry about at this point in time, the things we need to worry about to make this yeah. next bit happen. And that's coming back to what Anna was talking about too, about trying to bring the community along. One of the ways we're able to do that was by saying that we're only making in this treaty process at this moment, the decisions that need to be made for this and leaving open, trusting community that when they have the chance to make decisions, they'll make the right ones. And so that's what's really about is knowing we don't have to have all the details sorted out. We can go in a phased approach in that timing. Let's agree on the principles. Let's take it those steps at a time. Uh, but also be aware that part of what we're talking about with all this and self-determination is the government handing over their responsibility for things to our communities and oh. to recognise that they have to trust us that we're going to be able to do the right things and that the risk now sits with us, uh, that we're the ones who are going to take up that risk by them handing over authority. And that's another really important new way of thinking that we're hopefully moving towards. And I think that can be useful in collaboration across all those different spheres. Wow. Trusting the process, Anna, does that uh, um, uh, speak to new ways of working that's emerging? in in the in what you're seeing around the around the sector i mean absolutely and i'm just taking a moment to actually really sit with what that must mean in a number of the contexts both reuben ashley and and around this room as well um because they're they're important words but when we actually think about the stake um and what that means for individuals who um are being caught into the real unknown of that um yeah and what that means for this chapter a moment in time to really know that we to be able to build conditions to trust in the process i just want to acknowledge what that really means um yeah I, actually i just was and i was listening to both reuben and ashley i was thinking around the we're talking about collaboration as a process um and it's really a practice isn't it it's not a project <laughs> mm. It's an ongoing practice that I think we all are, are practitioners in the in the work and art of collaboration. Um, and I think part of that is the big assumption that sometimes needs to be renamed, which is we recognise that we have no other choice but to collaborate in order to, to create this shared future, because all our all our lives and our families' lives depend on that. Um, and that to do so. Um, Cause us into not just partnership. And I think this goes to your question a bit, Grant, doesn't it? Around partnerships are important and they have their place. And but when we're actually doing the transformational work that's needed, that's what collaboration is really about. Um, and we all into that, knowing that yes, there's unknowns, it's the trust in the process. Um, yeah. But also I want to come back to the practice point and something that we've been reflecting on a lot is. What is the practice that we want to support seeing more of um, in there and to help us get to that as CFI? Um, and this is just our way of looking at it is saying, 
Well, what if we say didn't exist in our form in 10 years as an organisation? What would success look like if we were not in the same form as we are now in 10 years? What's the kind of practice and work that we want to be supporting, enabling more of in the field um, so we can question our existence as an organisation um, in 10 years time? So that helps us to ask, yeah, really different questions about how we hold, again, back to the, the practice of how we hold our own power um, yep. in that as well. Wow. Powerful, powerful stuff. Thank you all uh, for, for navigating that. Uh, we've been talking um, about um, uh, collaborating and partnership, but uh, we'd like to uh, capture your feelings as well. Uh, and uh, um, before we shift uh, to talking about, you know, January 26th, we're inviting you as audience to write in the chat what challenged you specifically as a person who's interested as a participant here as as uh, someone who's come along here what is your specific challenge uh what 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 has challenged you and what you've heard from our um from our uh, our, our guest speakers what has inspired you what fires you up and think wow and what questions are you still holding so we're going to open up a time now where you're invited to reflect in the chat space um, on the bits that are challenging, the bits that are inspirational, and the questions that are emerging and uh, are yet to be resolved. So we're going to invite you into that space now. We're going to have some uh music and some space to reflect on that so folks uh welcome to the chat space and um we'll see you on the other side well wow, folks that has been uh um just some enriching reflections happening uh in this space so look I feel like I'd like the rest of the day just to process and to reflect on some of the the deep things that have come up. But I'm going to ask our panelists to do all the deep reflections and stuff like that. And I'm I'm intrigued uh, to hear from them about what they think has uh, come up in in the chat, uh, and and what has. Um, uh, I guess resonated and uh, uh, bubbled up for them. I'm going to jump in, Grant. Um, she's probably going to throw it back to Ruben and Ashley. <laughs> um, I think I was reflecting. Yeah, I saw it coming in the comments as well. We there is a there's a theme around time and pace, isn't there? You're right, Grant. Um, and how we create, you know, the environment for that time and pace to be to be pro and fluid, you know. Yep. And I was thinking about Ruben, your comment, someone else has put it in here too. Um, not everything happen needs to happen at once. And how do we know we've got just enough to take that next step? I guess I think about that a bit too around um, the January 26 conversation. Um, how do we know we've got just enough to take that next step about you know shifting that or so yeah, I guess that's a way, Ruben, to maybe throw it back to you in the first instance. What does that look like? in the work you're doing now yeah so I mean if I think about it from the context of the January 26 question I think sometimes the response that comes from the change the date is well what date are you going to move it to and to me that's 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 another question like let's decide that we're going to change the date and let's all have a conversation around that and then we can move to what do we want to make it to that doesn't have to be solved at the same time that's that's I think that's trying to answer too many questions at once so that's I think that's a really practical example with this conversation in particular and I think part of it stems from a desire we often have to kind of have this checkbox to be able to tick off all the things that we want to be able to do and have some certainty about what we're kind of entering into and when you're doing with collaboration you don't have certainty like if you were just doing it all by yourself you could have certainty because you get to decide everything and you can put it all down there and have a step one step two step three but when you're collaborating, the whole point of that is that there's uncertainty because you're going to be feeding off one another. That's why it's a collaboration. That's the, the value of it. So just being comfortable with that 
uncomfort around that, I think is really important. And how do we know what it is? How do you find that cutoff? That's, that can be tricky, but it's, I think ultimately comes down to what is the core interest we're trying to meet here with this first phase of the question? What is it that's really important that has to be answered now? Let's try and answer that. And then we can move on to the next question. Mm. And that's going to, that's going to vary depending on what it is you're trying to talk about, but um, yeah, it's, it's, what is the absolute heart of it? What's the really core thing we need to make sure we agree on? Let's kind of put that in place and, and move forward. Doing so as well, though, knowing that you might need to go back and change that core thing as well. You, you should never be saying that this is locked in and we're never going to change it. But when we're talking about collaboration, it's got to be clear that if we are going to go back and change that thing we thought was kind of a bedrock about what we're doing, that's got to be done in collaboration as well. It can't sure. be up to just one party to decide they're going to change something that's been fundamental to what you've agreed to. So I guess that's some ways of, of looking at that from my perspective. Yeah, Jenny put it uh, poignantly in the chat. She says, sometimes cool. you just have to be brave. Once there's that core thing established, if we don't know what life's like on the other side, we just have to be brave and uh, make that uh, decision and take that step. And then answer the next questions that need to be addressed once that decision's made. There was another good question there around the, the role of allies and what they could do to support things. And that's always of, of interest, particularly in the, the treaty conversation we're having, but I think around January 26 as well. And, you know, for a lot of these things, this is a, a political conversation that we're having. And at the end of the day, when you're talking about politics, politicians want to be re-elected. And so if they know that they're entering, entering into something, they're going to make a decision that they feel like lots of people in the community are going to be supportive of, that it's not going to be a reason that they're not going to be voted for, like the, the nitty gritty of it, that's the reality of what we're dealing with some of these things, then they're more likely to do it. So the more we can see voices out there from the broader community saying, we do support this. We do think treat is a good idea. We do think that moving away from the 26th of January as a day of celebration is a good idea. The more that is just the, the undercurrent of what everyone is feeling, politicians can then have the confidence to say, well, yeah, we're going to go along with that because they can see it's not a risk to them. So if we can make sure that as allies, we're sharing that message that, yes, we do support this, we do think it's a good idea, that can be really valuable. The other thing I think allies can do that's really beneficial is when I talk as a First Nations person about some of my concerns and my issues and our other members of our community talk about it, that comes across in, in one way and that can be valuable in changing some people's minds. But I think for other segments of our community, they're much more likely to have their mind changed when it's someone from their own community giving them their perspective, their insights about why they might have shifted their perspective. Mm -hmm. So if we can make sure that we're helping have that conversation so that people can see, well, there's someone who's like me and they've made this shift, maybe I could make that shift as well. So being an example of how we can change our minds of what is a different way to do things, that can be also really important. The other third thing I'd add to that is amplifying the voice of those who are out there or First Nations peoples. Uh, you should never be speaking on behalf of First Nations peoples, but you can amplify our voice. You can say, here's a really powerful thing I've read from this First Nations person. You should read this. Here's a powerful video. You should look at this. You should hear these things and amplify our voices within that conversation. That's a, another really powerful thing that can be done by allies. Yeah, that's uh, and that's a powerful thing there, brother. What you just said, I'll amplify that. Um, look, uh, did you want to add anything to that, Ashley, before we moved on? Because i got another critical question here. No, you go with the next question. I'm just yeah. going through a lot of um, processing and thinking yeah. about and uh, a reflection on challenges, especially. And I've got the, uh, I've got the, I've got the blessings of uh, learned people sending me questions to ask. And the yeah, next thing, nice. so one of them came from Crystal Taylor, who asked about how do we scale up beyond the programs that we're doing in Victoria and Justice New South Wales and in some of the stuff that CFI. How do we uh, sort of um, take this inspiration and this activity and amplify it? Uh, to the, our national dialogue around January 26. Folks, what would that look like? Um, uh, how would, how might we um, take this inspiration up beyond the, the borders of our conversations and our influence here? Mm. 
well, I'm happy to to start getting the ball rolling, but you know, um, on that, I think, and in part, it does speak to what Reuben shared earlier um, as well. I was thinking, and how do we, how do we, as allies as well, um, create more spaces for um, for this to be scaled to? So I, I think, you know, to Crystal's question, um, we're seeing a lot of this already, um, and of course, a lot more to be done. But you know, I think back. 10 years ago, Ashley, the story of Maranooka Burke as more than, you know, much more than this, but it was in part a demonstration of what can happen when we really commit to um, learning into what it looks like to come behind community leadership, what new governance models look like that really centre um, collaborative governance and quite complex and important cultural governance is part of that. Um, and from that learning, that's been the ripples of the change through that, both deep in Burke, but also across other communities to now models that have been scaled nationally around justice reinvestment. You know, I think that's incredibly important, powerful and exciting. Um, I think about the other work, again, a number of people around here are part of um, place-based change initiatives and the system that sits around that and the, um, the different collaborators that it takes to really be ensuring that place space initiatives are yes importantly deep and local but also rippling to other systemic changes that are needed around it um, so that's happening when we're seeing government thinking about its role differently um, not just as funder or decision maker but as collaborator as i said earlier we're seeing that when philanthropy asks role questions about its role and shows up as a long-term partner that enables a bit more risk-taking and innovation in how this can happen as well. Um, but I think there's almost another meta level beyond the initiatives of where we're starting to see more traction around some of this work, is this narrative piece. We've sort of touched on it here in the conversation, but um, I think there's something we're seeing around how do we more explicitly tell the stories, amplify the story, the voices, but also what kind of stories are we choosing to tell about our country and ourselves that paint and create a more shared future and a more promising equitable future as well and i think the power of narratives and stories is really critical for the window that we're in right now um actually i don't know if you want to riff off anything there yours. yeah i was just thinking about like reflecting on burke um, Maranooka and just the real strong community leadership, the local voices that are there. And it, it is about shifting um, ways of working. Instead of that top-down government are experts, it's really acknowledging the expertise, the richness, the history, the actual lived experience that, you know, it's not a nine-to-five thing. This is not people's jobs, you know, um, and while we're going through the questions, that was partly my reflection and thinking about the challenges is that, well, you know, we're on this panel today for two hours discussing some of the hardships and challenges of, um, you know, quite a, a difficult day for the nation. Um, it, it still sits with First Nations people uh, beyond this conversation, beyond this panel, beyond this, you know, um, looking at the chat and the questions, it, it is a hard time. So um, it's acknowledging that sort of, I guess, yeah, that history that we carry with us all the time. Um, but I think strategically or, you know, try thinking more broadly that you want to achieve um, a, a greater outcome is that, you know, it's pushing some of that, you know, those things that are hard to sit with aside and thinking, well, we want to make change so that it's different. So, you know, thinking of my daughter, she's not going to be experiencing these sorts of things or it's going to be different for her in a classroom learning about the history of this country. Um, to, I guess, make that real change, especially when we're thinking about January 26, it's listening to the local voices and acknowledging that this is a hard time, that there are... Um, really important stories and that narrative to reflect on and to share so that that healing does actually happen, so that there is that recognition um, and not in a sort of, you know, a light, light touch sort of way, but in a real, in a way that has tangible change, in a way that First Nations voices are kind of dictating what 
um, what they want to see, you know, if it is a different date, if it's the way that January 26 stays the same and the way that it is, you know, kind of the, the proceedings of the day. I know that uh, City of Sydney Council is doing a whole different thing here. There's more of a reflection and they haven't, you know, um, talked about changing the date, but it's that acknowledgement and that, you know, sharing of First Nations history and, and voices and leadership and elders to contribute to that conversation. Um, yeah, kind of sell, looking at the day more of like a remembrance or like an Anzac day sort of similar um, way. I mean, that's just one community's view, one council's view on how um, this day should play out. But it definitely is about changing the way that that you communicate and collaborate with communities and it's acknowledging that local voice and that community leadership. Yeah. Thank you, Ashling. We've got a, uh, a particular question from Jess who um, said, how do we make sure that there is genuine two-way power sharing uh, as opposed to uh, representation? There's a sense in which, like what, uh, what you shared there, Ashley, that councils are making decisions anyway. You know, people are starting to think, oh, we don't want to be part of that. We want to move. Uh, we are Indigenous people in these uh, power-driven dis decisions, and how can it really be seen as a two-way thing as opposed to uh, uh, an, an action or an expression of power by uh, a non-Indigenous entity? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chime in to start off here on this one. And, uh, I mean, I talk about this a lot with government at the moment because that's what treaty is all really about. It's about two-way power sharing, it's about handing over power and that idea of self-determination. And one of the ways I've found useful to try and get some buy-in and understanding from those that I do collaborate with is to recognise and understand that we're not talking about creating a whole lot of new powers out of thin air that First Nations peoples are suddenly going to have that they can exercise. What we're actually talking about is saying, well, at the moment, government, state government, Commonwealth government, local councils, they have powers. They have decision-making powers that they have. And what we're talking about is you as agencies, you as government organisations, but it also applies to other forms of organisations, having a think about what decisions do you currently make and which of those should you no longer be making, that you're going to take those decisions that you currently make and say, that's not our job anymore to make that decision. That decision has been handed over to First Nations peoples mm -hmm. and they're going to make that decision whatever way they want. That's what that means, that two-way power sharing, that self-determination. It's not trying to make some new decision that you didn't really want to make in the first place and give it them the authority to do it. No, it's about organisations thinking about what is the decision you're currently making that you should no longer be making and handing that over, not with all sorts of um, red flags around, not with all sorts of checks and balances that well, if you're going to make this decision, please make sure you do X, Y, and Z, and you've got to tell us about blank and blank. No, no. What we're actually talking about is saying that decision that you used to make, you're going to hand it over there, and that's in, it's a black box. You're going to have nothing to do with it, that decision. You don't have any say in it at all because that's what self-determination is. And trying to have that understanding that it's not creating new powers, it's taking your powers, handing them over, that's a really powerful shift that people need to understand because... I think there is this broad sense of, yeah, self-determination, that sounds like a really good idea. And at a high level, everyone buys into that fairly easily. But when you start trying to talk about it on that practical level of saying, well, currently you make this decision, and what we're saying is you shouldn't make that anymore. Uh, that's where we need to really talk about it in more detail and have that discussion with the understanding of that's what we're aspiring to. Yeah. And that's what power sharing actually means is those decisions handed over you don't have control of anymore and what we're talking about as well particularly from an assembly perspective is when we're thinking about taking powers from the government from my perspective at least we're not talking about the assembly now holding them we're trying to talk about how can we take those decisions and then also distribute them so that the local community they get to decide we're not going to be deciding on their behalf we're going to delegate that down so they've got the decisions as well it's an ongoing process from our perspective as well that uh, uh, it's a little bit like I see us as kind of trying to be the Robin Hood. We're trying to take powers from the government and not keep them for ourselves, but pass them on to other people as well. 
and the government is going to have no say on how we distribute it amongst them. That's the whole point of it as well. And that's where we're trying to shift things to. But that's a that's a strange mindset shift for, for government in particular. But we need to keep having that conversation. And the more you have those strange conversations, the more they start to seem normal. Yeah. I think the, the challenge for me in my space, just riffing off Ruben, is that while we're trying to get government to relinquish some of those powers, we're also trying to influence a system that will remain, but to change that system so that it is no longer discriminating um, First Nations people. So while there is handing over of power in some parts of you know, our work, there is also a need for us to have that strong influence um, into the ways that the law is, you know, yeah. Anna, do you have any insights on that in relation to Australia Day and the, how that might have happened oh. around 26? Yeah, interesting. My mind was going somewhere slightly different grant you um, go with that mind <laughs> sister don't you, you know. <laughs> i was i was really thinking around what reuben and ashley were sharing and there's something about um naming and questioning the water we're swimming in um and that's a bit about i think also the um the imagining what actually the that transformation is so what does real power sharing or letting go of power actually look like um which I imagine, Reuben, in that context is um, that you're talking about is actually not accepting the status quo or the incremental as well and fundamentally rewiring what we're seeing as the future state um, and reminding people of where we're at in that. So I think about, yeah, I think, and probably Grant, there is a connection there with, with January 26. You know, what is that future state that we are seeking to have as a country um, what's the story we want to tell ourselves? And I think from there, we start to question the status quo even more explicitly, but um, continually to name the water that we're swimming in being what is the dominant system that sometimes um, we don't often, especially those of us who are allies, have we have a privilege that we don't often need to name that water that we're swimming in. Mm. Um, so I think that's a really important practice to continue to do. It kind of feeds into our next activity that we're shifting in, uh, and that's really coming back to all of you as uh, participants here, and that is to ask the question, what are some of the practical actions, maybe reflecting on the waters that you're swimming in, but maybe one of those things that Anna's put out there, what are the, some of the practical actions you can and will take in response to this conversation? uh to rethink the approach around uh, your role as an ally uh uh if for the first nations people that are in here might be thinking about well which how will i own my power uh differently in light of these conversations and how might i um uh call for a bigger purpose but we're going to have a time of reflection where we can uh write up in the chat uh, the answers to some of these, uh, answer this particular question. So we're going to invite you uh, into that space now. Uh, it seems that uh, having uh, courage, uh, having courageous conversation seems uh, to be uh, the call of the day to a lot of people and amplifying the voices and considering um, power and privilege uh, is some of the, the key reflections coming out of that. Um, I'm just going to ask our panel if they have any final words as we've uh, come to the end of this thing, our time together. Anna. Thank you. I was going to hand to Reuben, actually. Um, yeah, look, I was reflecting on that. Um, having the, the courageous conversations uh, really resonate with that. And I'm also thinking about, you know, in my role, um, call it as an ally, as a, as a non-Indigenous um, woman, what it means to be a partner um, to my First Nations friends and colleagues 
as well in ways that, um, yes, create those brave spaces, but also safe. It's a big year. Um, and I am really thinking the moment around what it means to, yes, create more courageous conversations, have used my um, power, influence, proximity to different spaces, diverse audiences, um, to create more of these conversations at the same time, do that in ways that um, are safe for all. Um, so that I think is, is something more to keep reflecting on. Um, and that I guess that to tease out the diverse perspectives, as um, a woman wrote in the chat just earlier, um, Nabriza, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, that, that just struck me. My heart just started racing when I saw your post um, as a migrant woman of colour and your citizenship ceremony being on the January 26th and what that means. It reminded me, you know, let's bring in more diverse perspectives and voices into these conversations. Um, I feel like that's a real commitment that we need to keep making as well. They're just two of the things that have resonated through this conversation. Mm. Ashley, should I hand to you? Yeah, and I'm just thinking about um, those diverse voices and the importance to, to move at community pace. Um, that's just something I've been reflecting on this whole time. Um, and while things can, you know, I guess be bumped up on the agenda and, and on an organisation's agenda, a political agenda, and you may want to act, you know, a lot faster, it's important to check back in with community and move at their pace and make sure that you're bringing them along that journey and amplifying their voices and what they're actually calling for um, and really pushing for self-determination. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Ashley. Brother Reuben. Yeah, it's been interesting looking through the chat at all the different uh, reflections and actions that people are going to take, which I think is it's really powerful to see that. And I think from my perspective, two things to kind of reiterate that I think we've touched on at times, but maybe we could reinforce as well is, you know, we as a First Nations community, we're really diverse. So when we talk about amplifying the voices, you're going to hear voices out there that aren't the same, that are going to be different. And that's okay. That's part of the conversation as well. And so if you are sharing voices, if you can try and make sure you can kind of reflect some of that diversity in it. Um, you know, there are some more extremist versions of what the story is, the narrative out there. There's some more conservative versions of them. Make sure that there's a chance to share all those different perspectives so that people can hear those, those different views because we're not one homogenous First Nations community. There's, like I said, there's a lot of diversity. So be really mindful of that when we are sharing that you, you can um, spread the, that diverse message as well. The other thing is that if we talk, we, we've talked about kind of our side of things here, but the other side of the, the, the page where people are saying they, they want to have an Australia Day, they want to have it on the 26th of January, and that we need to be, make sure we go to the effort of unpacking what their interests are. And often their interests are just that they really like Australia, they think it's a great place, and I agree with them. I think Australia is a great place, and I, I, I think it is worthwhile of celebrating. Um, and so it's about not diminishing that interest of not saying, well, that's not an accurate interest to have. I think it's a perfectly reasonable interest to have. So make sure we're we can acknowledge that and recognize that and just talk about how we might have a different way that we could celebrate how amazing Australia is and one way to demonstrate how great it is that we could recognize the 26th of January in a different way. And so making sure that we're having that conversation of not just seeing it as a binary, yes, we're going to celebrate or no, we're not, but how can we unpack those interests? How can we collaborate so we can all achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve? Brother, that orange juice and orange rind at the same time, mate. Eh? I feel like cheesecake now. <laughs> but look, thank you so much to our amazing panel uh, um, uh, for your thoughts and what you've had to bring to us. We've got eight uh, minutes remaining. Uh, I've been uh, told for any final thoughts. If uh, Ashley or Anna or Ruben, you've got any critical uh, uh, things you'd just itching to say, now's your time to uh, to share it. I'll jump back in that and finish one more time and say for those who are interested in what's going on with the Assembly, with the First People's Assembly of Victoria, particularly those who are from Victoria, please follow along and see what we're doing as part of that process. And even if you're from other states, you can see what we're doing and 
hopefully campaign for similar conversations to happen in your places. So follow follow what we're doing as the assembly. And if you are a First Nations person who's living in Victoria or a traditional owner from Victoria, please enroll to vote. We've got elections coming up soon and we really want everyone's involvement in our process. So that would be my last call that if you at all interested in what's going on with treaty, follow along. And if you're eligible, enroll to vote, be part of the process. Uh, that's what I'll finish with that. Love these Victorians, they get in with their plugs. Fantastic, eh? My sisters, any final thoughts? Well, you've given them, that's what are your final thoughts? I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Bless you. Yeah, no worries, sis. Anna, you're good? Really good. Really happy to leave it with um, with what's been said. And yeah, really wonderful to have this conversation, Ashley, Reuben, um, also everyone around the in the room as well. I feel like it's a really great start to what's and, a really important year for us. Yeah, and these chats have been particularly rich as well. So thank you very much to the participants for sharing as well. Oh, 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 oh,